let me begin, uh, first of all, by reading our text and then uh, giving you these applications, and I'll have a quick word of prayer for us. We are in... Uh, we are moving into Proverbs chapter 18. We are finishing Proverbs 17 this morning. We are racing through this book. <laughs> racing. We need our friend back from Wisconsin, uh, who I think in a six-month hiatus uh, back here mentioned that we were now uh, half a chapter ahead of where we were last time. Even a fool... 1728, even a fool who holds his tongue is thought to be wise, one who stops up his lips to be discerning. 181, the one who separates himself seeks self gratification against all sound judgment. 182, a fool does not delight in understanding, but in his heart exposes itself. It is the heart that's doing the exposing. That's the way I have translated it. In his heart exposing itself. Here's three. When a wicked person comes, contempt also comes and with shame is reproach. And here's our final one for the morning. 18.4, the words of a person's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a rushing stream. Okay, here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs, what I believe that they are saying. Uh, 28 of 17, the wise say it. They say it well and then remain silent. The wise say it. They say it well and then remain silent. 18.1 The fool separates for his own reasons and strays into a self-centered life. The fool separates for his own reasons and strays into a self-centered life. Here's 18.2. The fool has no motivation for decency. Just watch and listen. He gives himself away. The fool has no motivation for decency. Just watch and listen. He gives himself away. Here's 18.3. The wicked person's companions are contempt, shame, disgrace. The wicked person's companions are contempt, Shame, disgrace. And here's our fourth and final proverb for the morning, 18.4. The power of Christ's words bring blessing to everything. The power of Christ's words bring blessing to everything. Now, here is the outline, and then we'll pray. What you have in these Proverbs, that we have the fool in the first three, that's 28, 1, and 2. And then in the third proverb, we have the wicked. See that? It's the mocker, the hardened fool, the man you cannot reach. He is a hardened heart and he is destined for the grave here to be certain for his attitudes and activities and separation for Christ with Christ forever. And then the fourth is a positive. Here is 
the wise, the believer, and his mouth. So we end with a word of wisdom. Great contrast in these Proverbs this morning. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, thank You for these diligent students of Your Word who come and listen and some take notes, but most importantly that we all ponder, think about these very deep and thoughtful sayings of the wise king, Solomon, who you gifted very uniquely among all mankind to teach us and to give us the skill for living. Lord, this is Solomon's thoughts, but your words. And so it is your words that go forth They will not return void. They will always accomplish the purpose for where you send it to each and every one of us in our own providence for the day today. Uh, So, Father, uh, bless us to that end with your holy word. You are the Lord of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. I was looking at a... uh, article in the sports section and I noticed the title of the article was Tiger Woods desperate to get back his game thought that was so interesting Um, so I began to think about that uh, title Tiger Woods so interested uh, desperate to get back his game well If you compare Tiger Woods to any regular good golfer, he has never lost his game. His game is far superior to normal mortal men. But what the article was really saying, it was his desperation in his practices for the Masters that is coming up here in November, is that he is desperately trying to regain his own game. The holes on the course is just the measuring rod. He's trying to get his own skill back. And I thought to myself, that's a great illustration of the book of Proverbs. These are skills to live by. These are the imperatives of the New Testament. That this should be our attitude. That this should be our behavior. This should be our way of life. And speaking to myself, I must be desperate to get them back. And then once in place, I need to hold them there. One other point before we begin. I'm... I listened to a lecture, non-Christian, secular lecture, on these new movements, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, and such. And it was a very insightful lecture because it said they're all about the crowd. They're all about society. It's never about the individual. That's important. It's never about the person. That's why they have no problem burning, looting, the idea of hurting someone. That's personal. It's not about that. It's about the movement. And of course, you could also add a theological concept that God was the creator of everything, and He said, you know, let it prosper, let it grow, let it multiply. And they are for everything to destroy, to burn, to loot, to tear down. But what was the striking contrast to me was look at these Proverbs. 
They're not about society. They're about the individual. This is child training in the household with the mother and the father, and they are developing the child for life. And it's all about the individual. So that when you walk out of the confines of this building and into a world of darkness, here is how your light is going to shine. Here is how you're going to be and you're going to stand out because you have skill that they know not of. Okay, here's our 28. The value of speaking when it counts, really. The link here between our last lesson, verse 27, and here, 28, regarding speech is rather obvious. Look, in regards to the skill for living, it was understanding in verse 27, but here it's discerning aspects of wisdom. The top line opens with even. See, we don't skip that word. It tells us something. We never want to run over words in Proverbs. Never take anything for granted. We're drilling deep because there are deep resources of wisdom in the way that Solomon is communicating with us. So we're going like the geologists down through deep strata here. And the word even tells us it's an idiom of reckoning, of logic. And it, it's about the fool. He's the subject. His actions, his activities. Look, he holds his tongue. Same phrase we had in Proverbs eleven twelve: 12. Holds one tongue who remains silent. And look at the perception when he does that. Is thought, there it is, the perception of third parties is he is wise. Isn't that interesting? Because in the book of Proverbs, the fool always has his mouth open. Always. Talk, 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 talk. And he's always shoving something in his mouth. It's a... It's a a cartoonish idea, you know, the Looney Tunes. He's shoving something in his mouth all the time. Shoving the world, shoving the resources. Here, he's quiet. It catches Solomon's attention. Line two, one who stops up. What an interesting verb that is. Now look that up. That's Psalm 58 Verse 4, the wicked are estranged from the womb. The liars go astray from birth. Their venom is like the poison of a serpent, like a cobra. And here is the verb, who shuts up. Shuts up. The psalmist says shuts up his ears. For our proverb, it's to shut up his lips, his mouth. Discerning, our familiar word of wisdom. To think, to speak, to act. Here is the action of remaining silent. It's the act of wisdom and skill. Discerning. We've talked about that word over and over. Quickly. Because we miss so much time together. Let me give you a quick reminder. Here it is. The dialogue between Joseph and Pharaoh. Joseph says to Pharaoh, now look for a discerning man. Pharaoh says to Joseph, who's more discerning than you? What did he mean by that? He meant, who could possibly prepare this nation for a giant food-saving program for seven years of prosperity and a distribution program to feed everyone in the famine of seven years. The action of what appears to be silent, not really wise, but perceived to be wise, is silence. 
And for some reason, and I really can't tell you why, in studying this, the thought of 1 Peter 2.23 ran into my head. Let me read it to you. When he was reviled, he reviled not back. When he suffered, he threatened not. All actions of the mouth. I spoke to you not long ago about the wisdom of our companion Jeff Brown. When he had the opportunity, he spoke, and he spoke clearly and effectively. And then he remained silent. That was wisdom. Our Lord had much to say, but He had already said it. He said it all through His ministry. And so now here at the end, He remained silent. And that was wisdom. What He said, He said. And then He remained quiet. You see, don't be in the habit of having to get the last word or reminding someone of something else. The wise speak it and they're silent. Here's 18.1, the one who separates himself seeks self-gratification. Our top line opens with the fool's behavior here. It is to separate. You see that? One who is divided internally or externally. We've studied this word before in chapter 16, 28. It was the perverse man who unleashes conflict that separates close friends. And look at this. The text says it seeks, it seeks self-gratification. To seek is to aim, like you aim at a target or something. And that's the fool's energy. That's the fool's time. It's for self-gratification. This would be the predilections of his heart to be whatever he desired to be. We call that living life on your own terms. A consumer of everything that is for you. It's the fool with the wide open mouth again. Shoving the world in it. Two things here. First, Solomon, our writer, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 10. Here's what he says. I desired myself nothing that my eyes desired. Same word repeated twice. Ecclesiastes 2.10. And by his own admission in Ecclesiastes, that led to a life of complete and utter futility. It exhausted him. Second, our Lord said, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, ask, It'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. You see, real seeking and aiming should be in spiritual realms. That brings the great dimensions of life back into your lap. You know, one of the lasting impressions that... S. Lewis Johnson made on my life, just like covering me from head to toe with lacquer. I'll never forget it. Is whether he was preaching here or it was in personal conversation or a student in his class, you would see this twinkle in his eye, this joy, this delight when he would discover something interesting or unique about the person of Christ. It was like... Christ was everything for him to think about. And you could see it in the expression on his face. He just delighted 
in him and the way he thought and the way he behaved and what he did. I will never forget his last sermon. 1 Timothy 1, 8-12, he entitled it, I've said it to you many times, I'll say it again, it left such an impression on me. He entitled it, The Immensities. The Immensities. All that we have in Him. And His message was, all that Christ did. All that Christ is. And all that that means for you and me. It means the immensities. Far beyond anything that we could ever think about for ourselves. But look at this fool in our proverb. Self-gratification. Self-craving. Line two, against all sound judgment, against all practical thought. Now let me give you an illustration of that. Genesis 13, 9. Lot, here's your word. Same word of the proverb. Separated. Lot separated himself from Abram. Why did he do that? In order to go his own way. Why would he do that? This is the man with all the promises. But his eyes weren't on the promises. His eyes were on something else. He was seeking something for himself. He was Glenn Yarbrough singing to us back in the 60's, Baby, the rain must fall wherever my heart leads me. That's where I want to go. That's a fool. That's a fool in a fool's way. And so, here's Lot pitching his tent down towards Sodom, getting closer and closer till he actually is in Sodom. But like everything else in the world that one seeks over and above the Lord, he thought he was getting this, and he actually got that. That's what the world will do for you. It will trick you every time. I can still remember listening to Donald Gray Barnhouse on reel-to-reel -reel tape, preaching back in the 50s in that magnificent apparatus of voice that God gave him. And he said, Fool, uh, Christians can make great fools of themselves. Never forget that line. What a preacher. Here's verse 2. A fool does not delight in understanding, but in his heart exposing itself. Derek Kidner, the Cambridge scholar, says, the proverb warns against having a closed mind and an open mouth. Again, here, as in our previous proverb, he's only interested in himself, his own desires, his own ideas. Our top line, the subject, is the fool. Again, and look at this very clear predicate in this top line. Does not delight. You see that? Delight. It's the word from Genesis 34, 19, used of Shechem, who immediately went about to satisfy the requirements to marry Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, because he delighted in her. It's an emotional response. Not a thinking response, an emotional response. And here, it's in the negative. It is the fool who has no motivation. He rejects, again, an emotional response. Understanding. Doesn't want to hear it. Don't want to hear that. Don't want to be a part of that. It's our common word found in the Proverbs for know-how. We've talked about it over and over. Exodus 31.3 used of the artisans who built the tabernacle in the wilderness. They were given understanding, skill, to build that tabernacle. But fools have no interest in seeking daily skill or living to please the Lord. No, not their mind which is what line 2 tells us. This incorrigible 
morally bankrupt heart from which all activities emanate. And look at your word here. Exposes itself. That is the famous word used in Genesis 9.21 of a drunken Noah who indecently uncovered himself. He exposed himself in his drunken state. So we know this fool. We know by the way he talks, by the things that amuse him, his run of emotions, always for the wrong things, over and over again. That's the person he is. In our previous lesson, 1724, we talked about his eyes. Remember? Too busy to focus. They were here, they were there. They were always on the horizon. His interests turned over all the time. It's, he's interested and passionate about this, and then that, and then this, and then that. You see it all the time in Hollywood. The way people change the most permanent relationship in life, a man with a woman. And they're fools. They're just fools. And their lifestyle exposes itself. So we know the fool. We know him by the way he walks. We know him by the way he talks. We know him by the way that he amuses himself. His run of emotion is always for the wrong thing. And he tells us over and over again by his lifestyle, his activities, his passions, who he really is. His heart exposes itself. What a folly. Here's three. Now we step away from the fool and we're on to the hardened wicked. The opening line reminds us of Psalm 1. Psalm 1 verse 1, it's the progression of wickedness. And it's been understood that way for centuries by interpreters. The three verbs, walking, standing, sitting. All a progression of man descending lower and lower and lower into the basement until he's a hardened mocker. That's the idea. In our present proverb here, we have a progression also of wickedness. Look at the two striking repetitions of the word comes. It shows movement, cause to consequence. Comes remind us that we are never in neutral. We're always moving in a direction. The wise become wiser still. You see, our game is not the game of golf. Our game is the game of life. And so, we take to heart criticism. I don't want to be that way. And we, we are teachable. We're humble. We're always serving because that's our purpose. That's our calling. That's our lifeblood. Service. One to another. Counting others better than ourselves. That's what we're all about. So we are on a quest to be wise, wise, and wiser. That's us. And so, our top line opens, when a wicked person comes. Now when? Let's don't run over that word. Don't run over that word. Stop. Think about that word. What's he saying? It's temporal, indicating there's a change in movement. You know that word. Here's that word. I was a confirmed bachelor until when I met. See? It's a change of progress. It's a change of circumstance. 
It's a change of weather. How many times have I heard men say, there we were standing out there on the third hole in our golf shirts when the northern came in and we nearly froze to death by the time we were on the fifth hole. That's this word, when. Don't run over it. It's indicating a change in the moment. And here, it's telling us troubles on the way. And the consequences? Contempt. That's a good biblical word. Contempt, meaning despise, disgrace. Now here's the word. I'm going to give it to you. You know it. You know this context. And you're never going to forget this word ever again because you already know the story. It's Genesis 38-23. Judah sent his friend Hira, the Adulamite, with a goat in tow to find the shrine prostitute and to retrieve back his cord seal and his staff. But Hira could find no shrine prostitute. And asking around, people said, there's no shrine prostitute here. So he goes back and reports to Judah. And Judah says to Hira, drop the matter. Just drop it. Leave it alone. Lest we be... Here's your word, Proverbs 18.3, disgraced held in contempt. But as we all know, God made sure the matter wasn't dropped. Because the shrine prostitute was not a prostitute at all. But it was, in fact, Judah's own daughter-in-law, Tamar. And from that event, from that event, the line of Christ moved forward. Isn't the providence of God amazing? Twin boys, and God chose the second, not the first, because He is showing that He sovereignly elects. And so it's always the second, and it is Perez. So the line, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Perez. And now look, this and in line two, so important because it actually adds to the wicked man's disgrace. Here's his companion, shame and reproach. Wisdom declares they're all inseparable. Shame refers to social dishonor. Now everyone can identify you. The very thing that Judah didn't want for people to know, now we know because of his behavior, what he did. Our final word, scorn and reproach, is what the community heaps upon him as a result of his behavior. We now all know about your wickedness, what you did. So let's put this all together so we follow through the progression of the wicked in the proverb. The wicked comes in, or two, and by coming in, he brings disgrace by his association, by his presence, by his appearance, and everything is escalated further, and it brings derision, shame, scorn. The proverb is a warning for you and me. And here's the warning. It's being played out in our country today in politics. You never sell your name for silver and gold. Ever. That's the proverb. How much better is a good name than silver and gold? Your name your reputation in the Proverbs, that is your credit card for life. It opens all kinds of doors with righteous people. And it is scorn 
derision and shame if you sell that name for whatever price. Here's our final and fourth proverb. The words of a person's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a rushing stream. This is not speech of all people. This is wise communication, wise speech. The opening of the top line. The words, that can be taken for any words, not necessarily spiritual words. Person is a term used 90 times in the book of Proverbs, usually for a male of any age, and the mouth, of course, is the human instrument that reveals the heart. So, with all of those things on the surface, look what the proverb is showing us. Deep means it's inaccessible, except to the one who is wise. He has it here. All times. All places. And His voice, His communication is like water. Tied, notice in the proverb, to the wellspring. Now, let's go back into their context, their culture. They don't go to the sink and turn on the tap. Having a train load of gold bars does you no good out here. You must have water to survive. Water is life. It is cash. It is a check. It is a wire transfer. That's water. In this day and age and time, and wisdom, the skill for living, is depicted with the image of a rushing stream, a constant inexhaustible supply of wisdom, skill. A person of wisdom can help, can assist in any range, a number of topics. They are there. And their life is to serve. They're servants. If you're wise, you'll seek out the wise. For guidance, for direction, for help in any number of areas of your life. And a reminder to us all is who and what we are as wise people. Let me remind you from Proverbs 18:4. Here is who you are. You're the light. You're the salt. You're the truth. Your mouth is wise. This past week, I did a burial service at a cemetery. And I realized somewhere in that moment that what I was saying was resonating because the people had come and they were filled with grief. Everyone was weeping. And then I began to speak and everyone stopped weeping and started listening. Afterwards, this woman came up to me and said, oh, that we had an audience of a thousand here to hear this. And I thought to myself, you know, my job, my job was to deliver the message. My job was to be invisible. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. And what her response was, her response was to His words. 
I did my job. I said it like He told me to say it in His own Word. And I kept myself as much as possible out of the entire equation. What I saw is that He brings life and He brings comfort and He brings blessing to any and every situation. And that's who you are. That's who I am. We walk out of this building and into darkness, confusion, corruption. But you are the light. You are the truth. You are the Word. Be faithful to what God has given you. To change, not society. Change the man, the person. May God give us the grace to do that every day. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this teaching ministry of Your Word. How grateful we are for Believer's Chapel, for the decades of testimony that it has had in this community, in this city, and around the world. How grateful I am to be back here with these Your people who love Your Word. And I pray that the imparting power of the Holy Spirit would imbue them with that immutable, powerful Word today to live their lives saying no to godlessness and unrighteousness and embracing the truth because that's who they are, the sheep of His, your pasture and the flock under your care. In Jesus' name, Amen.